Okay, well, welcome to History of Rhetoric 1. Uh, this particular lecture, lecture number one, is going to provide you with an overview of the course, the course procedures, how to get started with everything, and then also dive into some of the earliest Western rhetoric, and that is the ancient Greek Western rhetoric. The course itself goes all the way from the ancient to the medieval period, and that seems like it's not that much, but it really is a huge amount of rhetoric. It's about, oh, almost 2,000 years worth when you count it all up. So this is quite a bit of reading and quite a bit of material and what's most important is that it is foundational, very foundational to uh, a doctoral program in rhetoric. Not that everything you do in a doctoral program in rhetoric has to do with the history of rhetoric, but a great deal of what we're doing when we study the history of rhetoric is, is also studying the theories uh, of rhetoric, or at least the first theories anyway. I'm going to orient you first to uh, class procedures. Essentially the course has three components. This is a hybrid class, and that is that we meet one day a week, or one evening I should say, this semester. It's going to be on Thursday evenings from 6 to 9. And that is uh, our face-to-face -face meeting, but we have online lectures. I'll be posting those, I hope, at the beginning of every week. Then during the, the middle of the week we'll be having online discussions that mostly focus on a problem or a question. We'll debate or have a dialogue about a particular problem or a question that's germane to something that we're reading. Uh, rather than trying to cover too much ground with our discussions online, we'll focus on uh, just one or two different things. And then we'll allow our face-to-face -face class sessions each week to uh, give us an opportunity to examine more carefully the texts themselves. So the, the process is basically online lectures that outline basic things that you should be looking for, basic ideas, kind of a, a, a very skeletal things to look for, most important ideas that you need to, to be aware of or on the lookout for while you do your reading. Then you're going to do your readings and we're going to focus our, our discussion in the middle of the week on an important question or issue. And then the face-to-face -face class sessions will be probably less of a lecture than they are kind of a roundtable discussion about different passages, different texts, and uh, we'll get down into the text. That's, that's so much easier to do face-to-face -face than maybe um, uh, uh, doing something like that online. That's very difficult to do. So to get started basically one of the most important things you're going to need to know is that if you haven't taken an online class before we use Blackboard at Texas Women's University to be our sort of our hub, our information hub and that's where you want to go in order to get your announcements, in order to check your grades. Um, that's where all of these things will be posted and you should be on the lookout for that uh, each week. Normally I'll try to get my lecture, my online lectures posted by Sunday night. That gives us Monday Tuesday, Wednesday to engage in some discussion, and then it gives us Thursday evening to be able to, to have our class, and it also gives you the three-day weekend there to work on any kind of projects, papers or pedagogy projects, which we'll be talking about a little bit later on. One of the things you want to do is make sure that you check the syllabus very carefully, read through that very carefully, make sure that you acquire the text. The texts are fairly specific. Uh, there aren't an awful lot of additional copies of Robert of Basevorn, for example, you're pretty much going to be limited to what is available out there in print, and sometimes they're rather old. All of the things that I have listed as required texts are truly required. We may not read all of them cover to cover. We may only have, for example, in the case of Murphy's Synoptic History of Classical Rhetoric, we may only allude to that from time to time, but it is very important that you get a copy of that. Some of these texts, even though we're not going to march through them bit by bit, even though we're going to be just referring to them in an offhand manner throughout the term, they are exceedingly important for you to have. Um, now, some of them are hard to find, I realize that. If you've not already begun your search for these texts, do try to find them as quickly as you can. Uh, sometimes I'll have some online sources for you too, but for the most part, the big text that we're going to be using throughout uh, the first portion of the course is the Matson text because it's so comprehensive. So let's move on to our second slide here. And uh, you'll see uh, that I want to speak here for just a moment about the development of rhetoric in the Western world. Uh, you know, in the Matson text uh, and, and others, um, especially James Murphy says this in his synoptic history, that rhetoric is a Western phenomenon. I'm not going to get into that debate. Um, certainly we know that Western rhetoric and its development in the earliest centuries uh, B.C., uh, is extremely important. I mean, I guess you could find people from different parts of the world that would argue that rhetoric began there as well. But we're looking at it from a Western perspective, and uh, unabashedly sh so. So some of the things you need to know sort of in, as a thumbnail sketch, and that's what these lectures are for, just to give you a thumbnail sketch, what to be thinking about as you do your readings, um, would be this. 
in Greece, most people know Greece, cradle of civilization, you know, read Will Durant and all these folks who for decades have um, argued about the importance of Greece in Western culture, civilization, art, literature, philosophy, and so on and so forth. It is important to know that the Greek city-state, most of you have all taken world history at some point or another, and you know something about the development of Greece. What, what, what we fr frequently don't focus on, though, that should, that should be uh, given some attention is the fact that um, the, uh, the, the movement from oligarchies, which is basically sort of a tribal-based system uh, where prominent families call all the shots, this is the earliest form of governance in the city-states in the Peloponnesian Peninsula and um, in Greece as a whole. Um, this gives way, as uh, you know, some of your texts might point out, to uh, the, the rise of prominent individuals. And we'll see, you can see that in Mycena, for example, Agamemnon. If you've ever been to Mycena, it's really interesting. Um, uh, it's uh, these cities that once were ruled by oligarchs uh, become um, so the power gets concentrated in the hands of a monarch uh, or a de facto monarch like Agamemnon. Uh, and uh, Menelaus and, and others. And uh, the transition, however, from tyranny, and that's what tyranny means, that's what tyrant means. It means king, that's all it means. We've, we've given it a pejorative term for, uh, uh, or a pejorative meaning for obvious reasons. Um, but the, the transition from that to democracy was really significant, very, very important. Um, because once the tyrants are overthrown, the question becomes, well, okay, if we don't like oligarchy and we don't like tyranny, what, what, what will we have? And the answer is, if, if you're tired of being kicked around by the bully on the block or even the gang of bullies, the one thing you try to do, if you can, is set up a system whereby no one person's able to be more of a bully than anybody else. Well, that's the ideal anyway, is let's distribute power as broadly as we can. And, of course, that Athens is the model of that. Sparta's the antithesis. Sparta's a civilization that never grew away from that um, uh, oligarchy model but that's a different story. So when we talk about Greece and we talk about democracy, we're really talking about Athens and a couple of other cities where power was, for at least a while, distributed quite broadly. Now, now I want you to think just for a moment about how important that is because we don't really think about the rise of public speaking, rhetoric, early education in Greece and how important that is. But think about this. If you live in a monarchy, how many people do you need to cozy up to in order to get something you're looking to get? Well, the answer is probably one or just a handful of people who have access to that one, and that guy or gal is the king or queen, right? In an oligarchy, things are somewhat more complex, um, if less tyrannical. I don't know if they are or not. Um, you, have to, you have to convince enough prominent people to have your way, right? So in one case, you kind of got to kiss up to the king. In the oligarchies, you kiss up to at least more of the oligarchs than not. But in a democracy, look at how the game changes when you have to convince the majority of the townspeople, or at least the male property owners, because that's what we're really talking about here. Um, you know, not democracy in our in our view, but certainly democracy. You know, as opposed to the previous forms of government, you would call it that. Um, what do you have to do? You have to go and you have to convince a large number of people, usually in a single event or an arena. Okay, uh, in um, in Athens, it was called the ecclesia. You would go before the entire male population there in Athens, adult male population there in Athens, and you would plead your case. And and that population, we would consider it sort of a town hall kind of thing. That population could be 300, 500, a thousand men would decide everything from you know, for example criminal law? Did Joe break the law? Did Joe steal something? Did Joe murder someone? Did he commit treason? To should we build a new bridge? Or what should be the fine for parking your donkey in the wrong place? Um, everything was decided that way. And so if you were the kind of person for example, and this is very important, if you're the kind of person who had a business, for example, say you made sandals, and somebody down the block decided, I'm going to make sandals as well, only I'm going to make blue sandals. And he goes before the Ecclesia and he introduces a law that says Athens should be known for patriotic Greek colors of blue and white and we should pass a law that only allows for blue sandals. Well, think about that. He's the one that makes the blue sandals. You don't. And maybe he's cornered the market on blue dye. How about that? What does passing that law mean? That means that your family is going to go out of business and you're going to starve. So when it comes your turn to stand up and argue against the law, if you stink at arguing, 
you're in big trouble. So all of a sudden, rhetoric plays an important role. It plays an important role because of the development of the city. It plays an important role because of the fact that power is now distributed much more broadly. And it means that the onus is on you to make sure that you are able to defend yourself through the manly or womanly art of verbal self-defense. And sometimes the stakes were high. Might be that he accuses you of murder rather than trying to make blue sandals. Uh, a lot could be on the line. So what happens? Well, what happens is you see this rise of these teachers, at first itinerant teachers, and these were sophists. We'll talk about them more here in a moment. But people begin to say, you know, Joe is good at, at, at speaking. Maybe my kid um, could study under Joe. You know, um, once he's finished with his regular education, I'm going to go send him over to Joe because uh, Joe's a great great uh, uh, teacher. And so these guys set up shop, they uh, teach in their homes, they're very effective, uh, they get a reputation, and if you've got a family business or you're successful or if you've got the money to do it, you, s you should send your oldest kid off to be studying under this sophist who can teach them how to speak properly, stand up straight, tuck in your shirt, all that good, no that good mess. Um, well, along the way also, important things came up about the qu or questions about rhetoric itself. Like, what is it? What role does it have in shaping or influencing morality? I mean, what is rhetoric actually? I mean, we know it involves persuasion, but is it something that has an epistemic function? Do you learn through rhetoric? Does, is rhetoric a thing that teaches you anything? Can it teach you morality? What do we do about people who use rhetoric to persuade people to do immoral things? How should it be taught? What's the best way to help someone become a better speaker or writer? These are questions that are still with us today. Even 2,500 years later, we still grapple with these questions, which is why I said this course is such a foundational course. It begins the conversation about what is rhetoric.